we're going to get started. Let me pull up some slides here. So we're talking software demos today. So the goal is that you walk away with a couple strategies to help you maintain control. So especially during group conversations where you're getting invited to new people, uh, securing a solid next step, and ultimately how we're using the demo to advance and hopefully win the deal. So before we get into today, um, again, let us know in the chat if you have any questions. The Q&A button is a great place to drop it as well. It'll kind of push it off to the side. We want to make this as interactive as possible. It helps us customize the content and our speakers today. So we have Evan Hicks, who is an enterprise account executive at Calendly, big fan of the tool. Brian Tunick is a manager of new business sales at Zoom Info. Nick Sigelski is founder of 30 Minutes to President's Club, and I run a company called Outbound Squad, where we do sales training, especially around outbound, discovery, demos, all of that kind of stuff for some cool companies. So uh, we got quite the group today. So we were doing a little bit of practice for this, and uh, we got some good stuff. But before we dig in, uh, I want to thank our sponsor, Zoom Info, Calendly. Go check them out. Zoom Info's got a lot of cool stuff going on outside of you know getting data and a lot of what they've been known for. Calendly, one of the the best, I would say with calendar tools, you want them to be easy to use, and Calendly is a pretty easy tool to use that I find pretty effective as well. So uh, without further ado, let's get into demos. I think that the common mistake oftentimes is hopping on a demo as a rep and just going through every single part of the solution from start to finish. Uh, Brian, let's talk about this because we were prepping for this. And you kind of brought up and we were talking about, you know, what is the purpose of a demo? What are we actually trying to accomplish? What, why do we have demos? Yeah, yeah, it's a great question, Jason. Um, and uh, I'm not claiming credit for this, but we call that a feature dump uh, when someone gets on the phone and just, you know, left to right, top to bottom, goes through every single thing that the tool does, every button, every widget. Uh, yes, uh, Rackley, I think we're all guilty sometimes. Um, but that's not what a demo is. Um, you know, we're not, um, you know, we're not selling Subarus here where we get into the car and we show every single safety feature, every single thing, because you know, we haven't had a chance to talk to the buyer and understand what they need. Um, and so a demo is a tool to essentially take what you've learned in discovery and to then tailor an exact solution to the pain that you've uncovered. Um, and the second thing I would say is a demo is an opportunity to tailor that walkthrough to the audience and the people that you're talking to. A demo to an end user should be completely different from a demo to a C-suite suite decision maker, to an economic decision maker, to a CFO. Um, and so if you're not taking advantage of discovery in your demo, and if you're not tailoring your demo to your audience, you're certainly leaving money on the table every single day. Okay. Let's let's keep kind of the train going with this. I'll kick the next question your way, Nick. No. Yep. There's a, and I just wrote a LinkedIn post on this today. There's a kind of no discovery, no demo philosophy that you hear thrown around a lot where, hey, it's not okay to show stuff in your product until you've done adequate discovery. So is part of the purpose of a demo to do discovery? Should that be an intention coming into a, and when we say demo, you guys, we really need yeah. the call. We label the call as a demo call. Yeah. We're not implying that you demo the entire time during the call. And we're going to talk about a lot of the reasons why, but Nick, what are your thoughts on like the purpose of the call and how discovery kind of fits into the equation? Yeah. I mean, I think a demo is meant to be mutual navigation of how you and your customer can solve the problem that they are experiencing. And so if you think about a discovery call, okay, I'm trying to figure out details about the problem that they're experiencing. But if I'm on a discovery call, and I know we're talking about demos here, but I want to talk about a discovery call for a second. If I'm on a discovery call and it's just me asking all these questions and learning all this stuff, and there's no back and forth dialogue about, hey, you said this, it actually makes me think we might be able, you know, we've helped somebody else with something like that. If you're not sort of teasing how you might need, might be able to help on a discovery call, the discovery call the customer comes away and they're like, well, that was useless. They just asked me a bunch of questions. There's a unilateral transfer of information. And a demo should be the same way. There needs to be a bilateral exchange of information. And what I mean is on a demo, 
if I am doing 98% of the talking, that's going to be a miserable experience for me. I don't learn anything more about the problem. And there isn't mutual exploration of how Zoom Info can help them solve their problem or how Calendly can help them solve their problem or how Outbound Squad can help them solve their problem. Um, and so I don't even know if I answered your question. I appreciate the nice comment, Jeremiah. Um, but I think <laughs> the key here is bilateral, not unilateral exchange of information. It goes both ways. Can I follow up on that, Jason? Sure. Uh, because Nick, I, I love your point about the uh, exchange of information and the exchange of dialogue specifically. I, I can't count the number of times since I've become a sales leader yep. that a rep has come to me with a call on chorus, shameless plug, um, <laughs> uh, saying, hey, this call is great. I can't wait to review it in a coaching session with you. And then I open up that call in that coaching session and the rep has an 85, 90, 95% talk time mm -hmm. because the rep is thinking about, did I nail my talk tracks? Did I cover my, my features? Did I cover this and that? Um, and those deals almost never close. Yeah. I mean, I think one thing where I see a lot of reps mess up though is I've heard reps complain where it's like my demos, I've got to share all the value of what we do. This isn't a product training there's an important piece of a demo, which is making sure that the other person feels comfortable with the solution that you're sharing. I can hit all the right value points as I go through my Zoom Info demo, Brian. But if at the end of the meeting, the other person's like, oh gosh, I feel overwhelmed with like, I don't think I'm gonna be able to learn this, you have failed. And so you've gotta find ways to have back and forth engagement, both to discover, but then also to make sure that they feel comfortable with, yeah, I could see myself using this. I get this. Yeah, I, I totally agree with everything that, that you, you laid out. And I, I would also add that it's, I'd say it's simply not enough to just present your, your product or your service as some sort of solution to their problems. You have to make a, a real connection to their emotional challenges and their, their business challenges because the, the landscape of today's buyers they're receiving and have access to an unprecedented unprecedented volume of information. And they're really savvy, right? They, they have plenty of options to, to choose from. So during this type of engagement, you know, we, we often see a tipping point where it's going to come down to how well you make them feel understood and how you can really shape your demo to understand and pinpoint your solution speaking to their, their particular needs. And the tack back to discovery, that's really our first opportunity to elevate the buyer experience. And if it's done right, you're gonna learn a lot about their core motivations and really then set up the demo to be able to demonstrate how you're going to solve their most pressing problems that you've learned. Yeah. So I think this mindset shift, so we're going to get into today for everyone, how to plan for the demo, how to actually do the demo. These three, we're going to put them on the spot. They're going to demo a part of their solution for us. Uh, so before we get into that, I think the mindset shift of, I don't have pressure to just show everything off in my solution because that's not what the buyer needs. And that's not what they're looking for. Even though they might ask for a demo, and show me the solution. Really what they're looking for is we have this big need or problem that's uh, that needs solving. How do you do that, right? Mm -hmm. And really being narrow in focus. And Evan, you said, and I think our first call, it was drag the prospect through their pain, right? And then how you solve it, like really get them to feel the pain. So uh, I wanna start with a little bit of a debate before we talk about how to plan for demos, okay? <laughs> Let me know, I just launched a poll. Do you demo on the first call? Yes, no, depends, let us know. And, and then amongst you three, we'll have a little uh, fun debate. Yeah. Let us know, we'll, we'll give you a couple more seconds, everyone. Do you run a demo or demo your product or solution on the first call? Can I answer it? Go ahead, Nick, you start. Uh, the answer for me is, is yeah. And that is true when I sell sponsorships with 30 Minutes to Presidents Club today. And that was also true when I sold uh, accounting software to law firms. And 
there's a like this common thing people talk about now, which is like discovery is not just the first call. You need to be discovering throughout the whole sales process. Yes, true. The same philosophy can apply to a demo. Like there would be times that my demo when I was selling legal accounting software, I would show a 90 second demo towards the end of a discovery call as a teaser for the next one where we've had this conversation and it's like, hey, you know, you told me you're dealing with some issues with your analytics. Let me just pull up really quick. We're not going to be able to go super in depth on this today, Mr. Customer, but like this is a sense of like some of the dashboards that I'd be really excited to show you when we meet next week um, because you mentioned you can't see this and here's this right on the dashboard. So it's okay to show slices of the product throughout multiple calls. Demo shouldn't be confined to just one stage. I'm always prepped to show my solution. Yeah, what I hear there is that much like discovery, discovery is not a call, it is an act. It is something that you do. A demo doesn't have to just be a call. It can be something that you work into your sales calls. And by the way, I don't know if you guys saw the poll, it was 20% yes, 46% no, 34%. It depends. I think what you sell is a really big part in how big the solution is and the audience that's on that call is really big too. Mm -hmm. But uh, Evan, what about you? What are your thoughts? Do we demo on the call? Do we not demo on the call? Why or why not? I'm firmly in the it depends category. Now, of course, discovery is yeah. the most critical component in the very first interaction with, with a new lead. But let's think about this just to put myself in a kind of like the Calendly atmosphere where I'm I'm working with people who have never seen Calendly, but I'm also working with lots of folks that already using Calendly, and they're just curious to, to learn more about what we can do. So in some instances, it's more appropriate to use the product and the screen share as a tool in order to further that conversation, that relationship, and that discovery process. And it also comes down to, I, I would say, just instincts, understanding and reading the room and the person that you're, you're speaking to. If you really have a sense that maybe they are a visual learner and you're on a certain topic, well, perhaps you want to open up that screen share, talk through and show them exactly what you're, you're discussing rather than it being so theoretical. Make sure it's visceral, but also ensure that it's impactful, not just showing a, a piece of the product just to show it. You wanna actually use it to further that conversation and provide value. It's, it's a very simple concept that seeing is believing. If you have something that could just blow someone's mind because it's a workflow that's just so tight, like Brian, you guys have some stuff I'm aware of with Zoom Info that's kind of like that, where you just show them or, you know, Evan with like the text reminders and stuff. That's like just something very simple, it takes two minutes. It's like, whoa, <laughs> you could do that. Like you can remove all of that work and like get rid of all of the no-shows that we have. So I think like getting the person ready and excited to see something is definitely a big part of it for sure. Brian, what's your, what's your philosophy on this? Yeah, Jason, I, I, uh, I, I would agree with the, the, it depends. That's what I tried to check before zoom told me that participants weren't, or, uh, weren't allowed to vote. So, um, I would say at, at zoom info, you know, 90% of the time we show some kind of demo on the first call, especially if, if the customer seems to be a fit for, for our most, you know, commonly purchased product, which is sales OS. Um, we do have some products that are a little bit more in the data orchestration and account-based marketing spaces. They require more discovery, longer demos, and we and we do it a little bit differently there sometimes. Um, but I mean, we've all heard the phrase "time kills all deals," and so you know, one of the things I always try to do, at the very least, is to get some kind of a wow moment on that initial call, because I think of the deal almost as like a balloon that's full of prospect excitement. And the minute that first call ends, that balloon starts to deflate. Um, and that's how much time you have to close your deal. And so if I don't get a wow moment out there and inflate that balloon on that first call, I don't feel very good about my deal or my odds of the prospect necessarily turning up to the next call. Yeah, you bring up another really good point too, where you know, I've talked about multi-threading just so much in the last like couple quarters because it's this year has been filled with deals taking longer and more people involved in the decision-making progress uh, process. And when you think about multi-threading, a big part of that is trust. Mm -hmm. It's Evan, for you to invite other people on your team, 
you need to know it's not going to be a waste of their time. And, and what better way than to show something that's like, wow factor, like you said, Brian, yeah. where Evan goes back to Nick and Brian is like, dude, you guys, you got to see this. It's crazy what they can do. Like that excitement, like it really helps get additional stakeholder involvement as well. Were you going to add something, Nick? Well, yeah. I mean, I think it also then helps you it's almost a competitive differentiator when the customer gets to see the product sooner. Somebody put in the Q and a, they were like, well, how would we do this? If we have SDRs who are taught not to demo, they need to just do the initial discovery. And I'm like, cool. If I'm an AE and I'm meeting with a customer on the first call and my competition is like dragging them through a crummy SDR discovery first and won't show the product at all. And I can be like, boom, let's accelerate you through the sales cycle. Um, that's a win for me because now if I think about the customer experience, competitor A has had a discovery call that went meh. Me, we had some discovery, but I teased the product and they already feel deeper along than me. You have to put yourself in the shoes of the buyer where they're like, great, I was told I need to go buy a, uh, you know, a tool like Calendly and I'm looking at four different options. And like, if Evan is the only one who gave me a teaser into the product, I feel like well, this is going to be easier to buy. I've already seen the product everywhere else. It was just a call. You can actually tilt the odds in your favor when you do a little teaser like that. Nick, yeah. I, I would add to that. Um, if anyone on this call is managing an SDR that is sufficient or good at discovery, mm -hmm. for the love of God, promote them to account executive right now. <laughs> um, discovery is the most important part of your sales process. Um, and I love SDRs. Zoom Info loves SDRs. We serve SDRs probably more than any other role. But discovery is not easy. And it's certainly not something that happens easily you know, on a cold call to set up a meeting. So uh, again, your SDRs who are doing discovery, if they're good, you're probably leaving money on the table there too. Yes. So I think actionable tip here is if you have a wow factor element in your solution see if you can tease that on the first call get people use it to get people excited um let's keep moving so evan i'll kick this question your way let's let's start getting into how we prep for a demo so i think a situation that a lot of people are going to relate with and brian sort of brought this up earlier is tailoring the demo to the audience so there's kind of a couple situations that i see where I have the below the line buyer, the manager of something, the, the person that is just experiencing the most pain, wants to see the solution. I'm doing a demo with just groups of people like that. And then the other really common one is, hey, we multi-threaded, they're inviting their boss, an executive is maybe coming on. And now all of a sudden they have two different audiences in this demo. How do you think of prep when it comes to tailoring to the specific audience that's going to be on that? demo with you when you're talking about Calendly? Well, that, that's the key word is tailoring, really. And that's going to start in discovery because it's going to help you formulate really a, a diagnostic framework from which you can formulate the strategy of your particular demo. Now, ideally, you've done all your research, you've done your prep. So you've done a walkthrough of your demo environment, you've picked out in certain, certain circumstances, here's what I want to show them. I even, as a best practice that I found, have I just create separate tabs in a web browser. So that way I don't have to be clicking around in the product, waiting for a web page to load. One of the cases I can just quickly pinpoint, here's exactly what I plan to show you based on what I know. And we can pivot from there, of course. But the other element that you were mentioning, Jason, is how do we go into a demo prepared to handle different stakeholders, different personas? And there's a lot of different ways to approach that. Now, first and foremost is, is discovery and preparation and research, but lean on others internally. If you need to, whatever resources, maybe it's your manager, maybe it's a solutions engineer, teammates, do some pre-prep. I would also take that step further that if you've identified really a champion that's driving this evaluation, have a pre-call with them, especially if they're going to bring on executive level, level leadership. Let's have a call based on, here's what we know. Okay, what's going to be important to CX, whoever? What do they need to see in order for this time that we're going to ask of them to be valuable and impactful? 
let's plan for that and we collaborate on it so that you feel comfortable going in there and can execute on a really solid strategy. I think there's two really key elements that you shared there. You're predetermining, you're choreographing the demo, right? You're predetermining what you're going to show them based on what you know. Uh, the other thing, I'll drop this into the chat. This is like part of a note-taking template that I teach with demos is like, you should know each person that's on that call, you should know what's their status quo. Like what's their current challenge? What's the consequences of not fixing that challenge? And what do they ultimately want? You're probably not going to be able to answer that for every single person that's on the call, especially the important ones. That's where that prep call with your champion comes in. And that's where you could fit in additional discovery at the beginning, you know, of your demo call as well, especially if it's a separate call. Um, Nick, looked like you were going to add something, but what yeah, are your thoughts? I, I prep? just think what are things that you want to do beforehand. I mean, what Evan mentioned about the multiple tabs is so brilliant because it is so frustrating when your internet isn't working. Like, you can just literally click, 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 click. It it de-risks things going wrong in your demo, and it makes what you're showing seem so much easier and faster, which perception is often reality in a demo. Um, from my standpoint, what I'll do before the demo from a prep perspective is I know the eight or nine different like features or components of my solution. Right. I've got like podcast ads that I sell. There's webinar sponsorships I sell. There's newsletter stuff. And what I'll do is I'll actually look at my sales notes and I'll go through those notes and I'll think about how could I relate anything that I heard from the customer to a feature of what I'm going to show. And so what I'll do then is I'm actually able to think about the map of, okay, I'm going to show this feature, this feature, this feature. And what I'll do is I'll literally write on a piece of paper, okay, I'm going to talk about the customer's podcast ads. And I'll think about what problems did I hear from the customer that they're looking to solve can be solved by that specific feature. And so when I'm explaining it, I know the key things that I need to talk about from a tailoring perspective related to that feature alone. So that's like, I think the biggest uh, lever that I have in making my demos better. Yeah, that's the difference between just showing features and functionality and showing true impact. And the difference between, hey, wow, you've got a cool product as opposed to, wow, based on what you've shown me, this will absolutely help my business. Yeah. I mean, and then one other thing that I will do is in the beginning of the demo, when I'm sort of setting the agenda, it's I'll say something like, you know, okay, I think our plan for today was, was to take you through what a sponsorship of 30 Minutes to President's Club looks like. And so um, I was looking at my notes before this meeting and as I was thinking about what we show. The big three things that I heard from you that you were looking to solve were A, B, and C. And so I've prepared like how we're going to address that. But before I keep going, like, is that right? Are those the big three things we should be focusing on? And that's how I can get them to either restate those problems or pains or add stuff that might have I missed or came up between last call and this call. And it just makes the demo so much more real and helps orient my head around what I need to show. Yeah, I think, you know, a few things come to mind. Evan talked a little bit, and Jason, your original question was about, you know, how do we handle demos where there's different personas on the line, right? Maybe a champion, maybe a decision maker, <laughs> an economic buyer. Um, and I love what Evan said about, you know, getting your champion on the phone, having that pre-conversation and, and prepping and learning about everybody. Um, and certainly, I think that that's a great tactic. Um, there is a counterintuitive tactic that I've been using for about 10 years, which is more or less the opposite of that, yeah. that has yielded uh, some phenomenal results for me. Um, and I call it putting your champion in the hot seat. Um, so Jason, if you're my champion, let's say, and you bring your CEO and your CFO to a call, I can prep a lot and I can learn a lot about your company. Uh, but unless I have an incredible relationship with you, I'm probably not going to know a ton about what was discussed internally ahead of that meeting. And so one of the things I often like to do if I get into that call is I'll say to my champion, and I will not tell them that this is coming because I do not want to spoil the results of this question. I'll say, hey, Jason, sorry to put you in the hot seat, but do you mind giving the group a 30 to 60 minute explanation as to why you wanted to bring everyone together today? And Stop what that... Right. 
30 to 60 seconds. 30 to 60 seconds. Did I say minute? Yeah, 30 to 60 seconds. Well, so, hey, Brian, <laughs> hey, Brian might have COVID brain too. He's recovering. From COVID. <laughs> uh, yes, definitely not 30 to 60 minutes. That would be really rude to your champion, but 30 to 60 seconds. <laughs> and what this does is it allows you to hear exactly how your champion perceives what you do and understand likely how they described it to the other people on the call. And it could tell you exactly how much work you need to do on that call to elevate the conversation and drive value, or has your champion done that for you? So I do like to sometimes surprise my champion with that question because it can put me in a massive advantage and help me audible properly for the call. Love this. I would give two more little things that I would recommend for prep and one's customer story. If you haven't already thought about it to this point, I feel like customer stories are the most underrated element in sales because they're they're kind of hard, especially if they're not your customer that you closed. But as you're showing use cases and features, walking them through and sharing, hey, this is how a similar customer accomplished this outcome using this workflow I'm about to show you, right? Um, and then lastly, knowing what your ask is going to be. What is the next step? And like, seed that next step at the beginning of the call. So what are you going to ask for? Is it, we need access now to the economic buyer? Is it, we need to round up more people to get consensus? Is it now we've moved into a pricing conversation and we're scoped? Like, what is the next step? Like knowing what you want to ask for prior to that demo is super clutch. Um, so I'll drop that into the chat. That was takeaways from prep. I have a question. I think this will kick off the, the how to demo section. This is where we'll spend most of our time today. Uh, Joe Alvarado essentially asked, and it sounds like Joe, the context there is that Joe was maybe doing some demos in person. Mm -hmm. And now it's work from home, remote environment. And before we get into how to run this call, what I think would be really interesting to address with you three is, how do you think about just keeping the group engaged? Because I don't know about you, one thing I pay a lot of attention to especially on sales calls is I, I am looking at people's faces when I'm doing stuff. And I notice as soon as you share the screen, half the audience will immediately look over at their other screen and start doing this, you know, <laughs> as soon as you share the screen. So uh, I'll kick the first question uh, your way, Brian, how do you think about like keeping everyone engaged? And is that important to you? Is it important that certain people are engaged? Like, how do you, how do you keep people engaged in the call? Yeah, it's a great question, um, and it definitely is important to keep uh, everyone engaged, um, especially those decision makers who can very easily uh, slip into their email inboxes on another screen. Um, I think it's important to, to know, especially if you're demoing over Zoom or some video platform like so many of us are now, and I used to fly to, de I used to, fly to demos, I used to travel all the time, haven't done it in almost four years now. Um, we're not just salespeople anymore. Uh, we're also basically video producers. Um, you know, we are creating content in an improvised fashion directly in front of the customer. And it's important to remember that. Um, I know that most of our most talented and, and highest performing reps at Zoom Info have a catalog of visual assets that they know extremely well, that they know when to call up on a demo, when to bring to the screen, when to stop the screen share, when to pause the screen share. And if you don't know that you can do that, you need to know that you can do that um, because it's a superpower. We're not just salespeople anymore. We're creating this experience. And remember, somebody's looking at you through a square screen. It's the same shaped screen that they watch Ozark on. It's the same shaped screen that they watch Killers of the Flower Moon or Barbie or Crazy Rich Asians on. And so they have a high expectation for the entertainment value or engaging nature of what they see in screens. And you have to live up to that. So we need to get Celsius and be more like Nick, it sounds like, in our demos. Yeah, I think so. Henry calls it caring loudly. Uh, if you've ever heard Henry, uh, you know what I mean. <laughs> Does a good job of that. I, I have a couple things, Jason, if it'd be helpful. Sure. Um, Okay, the first one is actually sort of related to the Celsius and the energy and like the engagingness of like you. And my philosophy is we're talking about tailoring, right? But on any demo, there is stuff that I am 
always going to show or I'm always going to say. I need to have that scripted. I need to have that memorized as tightly as possible so that I can focus all of my mental faculties on the delivery of what I'm going to say. The stuff that I'm going to repeat every single demo, when I say it, I want to be really, really engaging. I want to be focused on my emphasis and my tone. And I can't do that if I'm also trying to catch up to what I'm going to say. What that also does when I memorize the repeatable stuff is it frees up brain space for me to think about the tailored pieces and where I need to flex. And so piece one, I try to script the stuff I always repeat. Another thing that I do, I've got a couple rapid fire if you're okay with it, Jason. Uh, Absolutely. Before the demo, if I've got two or three people on the demo, I'm going to pick up the phone and I'm going to call the people that I've not met before the demo. And I'm going to say something to the effect of, hey, Brian, I saw you on the invite for next week's demo of Zoom Info. And I know you and I haven't spoken. I wanted to see if we could talk for two or three minutes about some of the stuff you're hoping to get out of the session. Give me a call at this number. Half the time, Brian's not going to call me back, especially if he's a C-suite. I'm going to follow that up with an email. And what will happen is 40% of the time between the call, the voicemail, and the email, they'll send you back a couple bullet points. Cool. Now I at least have some engagement and I know what he cares about. So I try to do that. The best part is now if I've had a conversation with two or three of the five people on the demo, awesome. I've got a couple of folks who are a little more bought in. So the pre-demo call is something that I do. Um, the other thing is make sure that you take full advantage of like the presenter tools that you have available in Zoom. There's ways you can like put stickers on the screen. There's ways that you can like draw on the screen. You should be using the chat to engage your champion. I might message Jason if he's my champion on the side and say, hey, how are we doing? I haven't heard Jim speak up. Should we ask him a question? Like work with your champion via chat. And then also chat unengaged stakeholders. It can be helpful if you've got a big room, bring someone from your team on so that they can help engage folks that aren't engaged. So those are some rapid fire ones that I like to do. Love that, dude. Do you ever send a message uh, to someone on accident where you were trying to message your champion and he said, hey, what's what's wrong with Evan? He's not I engaging. Get so Evan. Well, I get so <laughs> nervous when I'm like chatting in the Zoom privately. So what I try to do is like anything that I send, even if I'm sending it privately, I'm like, I have to send it in a way that it's okay uh, yeah. that if I accidentally sent it to everyone. So I won't ever say, man, Evan seems really grumpy today. How are we doing? <laughs> I'll just say like, how are we doing? That could be a great manipulation though. You, you send it to the person who's not engaged. Why is it? Tim engaged. Oh, sorry, Tim. That was bad for Jason. <laughs> Alex, but yeah. man, Evan's hair is off today. Your hair looks great. Um, but that's a way to get them to be like, yeah. oh my God. It's a human <laughs> element. Human you think element. About well, it, yeah, so I think there's a lot of good points here. And, and one way to, I, I would say, avoid that kind of like engagement lapse is, I, personally, I like to engage them at the start of the demo. Nick made a great point about, hey, here's what I know about you. Did I get it right? What Anything you'd like to, to amend or add? And if I have multiple people on the demo, I'm going to go one by one. And I'm going to ask for permission, of course. But as part of the agenda, I'm going to ask, what are your top two or three priorities, if, I could, if we have time, that you need to see today? And I'm marking that down. So I'm going to ensure that I've got a good plan in place but I also have that in my back pocket. So if I notice that there is a lack of engagement, I can pivot and say, look, you know, Jason, you, you really were curious about workflows. Why don't we touch on that now? Boom. Mention his name, mention what he's most interested in, get that engagement back. Yeah. But don't forget I think the why. Don't, don't yeah. forget why is that important. Maybe even before you go, we talked about discovery going all the way through the demo. Jason, you mentioned that you really wanted to see workflows. Why is that? What's driving that? Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would agree too. Because ultimately you need to get down to how is that going to impact them? Can't just be, this is a cool feature that does X, Y, and Z. You need to tie it back to the impact that it's going to have on their team and on their business. Yep. So that's a great engagement strategy is calling on people like individuals. I've noticed with demos, I notice this with large training calls that I do too, where if you just ask the group a question, 
you don't get very many answers when you do that. It's got to be pointed to a specific person or like a specific ask yes. to do, uh, hey, what do you guys think? I know we got a big group today of 15. Um, ask Brian, Sharon, do you guys mind dropping in the chat? Like, what do you still need to see? What, what have we missed? You know, so being able to engage people and giving really, really clear directions is important. You guys have sort of mentioned this as we kind of segue into like getting the demo started. I call it a state of the union slide. Mm -hmm. The very first slide is here's the critical challenge that I've heard from you. Here are the contributing factors. So these are kind of the, you know, AEs are not self-sourcing pipeline. The contributing factors are we don't have a playbook. We haven't trained them on this. We don't have Zoom info, <laughs> you know, like that kind of thing. Um, and then it's like desired future state. What is it that you want? And then you show that first. I like doing that on a either a slide that is not in presentation mode or a document on just one page. And then I add stuff live as the group is chiming in. So I'm curious, like, how do you guys, how do you formally like kick off the demo? Do you do something like that? I'll just kind of open it up to the group actually. Do you do something like that to kick it off? Is there another way that you kind of transition into like, hey, we're getting started now? Yeah, I certainly, I, I have a phrase, show them that you know them, right? I think it, it earns respect and it differentiates you from right at the top of the call. So I think having a slide like that, or at least some bullet points prepared to, to say something, if you think that's going to be a more impactful way of getting the message across is, is super powerful. And, and I would add as a, as, as a sales leader, when my reps go and make these types of slides, I often will say to them, you know, how difficult it is for you to make this slide is a direct representation of how good of a position you are in in this deal. Yeah. If you can't make that slide very easy, loud and clear, real pain, then you know you have work to do. Yeah. I think the same would apply to the follow up email. If you have a really hard time summarizing the key points of this, it's like yeah, you're missing some stuff. <laughs> um, Evan, Nick, anything to add on that? We adopt a, a similar strategy. It really ensuring that we're not just talking, talking, talking. We need a visual and we're going to make this collaborative. I like the approach that you you take, Jason, which is we're going to add live. And I think that really is at the intersection of that agenda. Hey, here's what we know. So you can really use that as a tool to further that agenda and set the stage for that level of engagement because if they feel heard, they feel understood, they're gonna be more engaged in, in looking at, hey, Evan knows our business, he understands our challenges and what we're trying to accomplish. I'm gonna pay attention to what he's showing me. And I need to get that, that sort of buy-in from them on the, the front end. And so using that visual is a, is a really good tool and it doesn't have to be anything that you spend 10 minutes on, it could be, one minute of of a 60 minute demo you know just to, to set that stage i think it's a really good tactic and it's your yeah. business case too in one doc that that is the business case right go ahead nick yeah i mean i think it's helpful to have a visual that um sort of aids the discussion i use something like this i use like a, a discovery deck where it's like it's got the quick agenda it's got who's on the call um i'll do a quick summary of like hey here's the stuff that i heard and to your point brian it's like if I struggle putting together the priorities that I heard, well, gosh, I'm not in a good spot in that deal. I give them a really quick teaser of like, hey, here's early. We're going to show you actually how we do it. But like early on, here's how I'm thinking. Um, but before we even get into that, like, let's say we get this thing right. Like, what is it? What does success even look like? And I use this as a a discovery tool before the demo. And this this sometimes goes 20 minutes because you have an extreme, extremely loquacious prospect it sometimes goes like five minutes because they want to get into the demo you kind of got to use your read on it but i love having that visual aid because it shows you put the work in to do that and if the prospect's like man he, nick wrote down all the things that he heard and he like put this thing together they'll they'll give you a little bit of credit with their time for the work that you did yeah jason you mentioned that discovery is an act couldn't be truer and it, and it occurs throughout the entire sales cycle. Nick, to your point, using a, a deck as a way to further discovery. Absolutely. We, we do the same thing. I think it's a great strategy. You can do the same thing with the demo, but that discovery process never stops. 
So let's uh, let's put these guys in the hot seat. We'll kind of go in order here. We'll start with you, Brian. Uh, what we want to do here is we're going to have everyone kind of maybe spend two or three minutes role playing what they would like, how they would demo a specific feature of their product. And um, yeah, we'd love for you guys in the chat, share your takeaways. What do you see these guys doing that you could adopt with your demos? Go ahead, Brian. All right, Jason, you're going to be my uh, my prospect. Cool. All right. Jason, so earlier on in the call when we were talking, you had mentioned that not only are your SDRs having a hard time getting in touch with decision makers and, and getting them onto meetings with your AEs, and that's driving up your cost of acquisition, but often, even when they do get on the phone with account executive, it sounds like there's a there's a timing issue. Is that right? Yeah. So a lot of times when we're going outbound or SDRs are getting these meetings and like the prospect is kind of like, there's no urgency, right? They're like, we don't really need this. They're punting to next year. There isn't really anything going on that's driving them to buy right now. Absolutely. I'm hearing this a lot, especially from teams that have, you know, five or fewer SDRs like, like yours. You don't have the resources to blanket your whole market with phone calls every single day right? You're selling to these legal firms. Um, and so wanted to quickly show you how we help customers address that at Zoom Info. Um, and we do that by basically helping folks like you prioritize your outreach based on what we would call buying signals or intent signals. Um, so I would ask you the question, you know, what would it look like if rather than calling every random legal firm in Colorado, if your SDRs were specifically calling on legal firms, there's a hundred this month who are doing an abnormally large amount of research across the web right now about document shredding. According to Forrester, 74% of the time, the first vendor in the door wins. And so what we're seeing is that this raise, raises win rates, it, increases, or it decreases time to close. I'm wondering, how do you think it would impact the business if your SDRs were focusing on a list like this rather than just calling any legal firm on any day? Yeah, I mean, I think it would be, yeah. So you're telling me that they could call legal firms that are like actively looking. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I, mean, I imagine they'd waste a lot less time, you know, on the phones with people that aren't ready to buy right now. How do you think it would impact their confidence when they picked up the phone if they were looking at data like this every single day versus just calling a partner at a you know, large law firm? Let's stop there. Cool. So, Brian, do you want to just quickly kind of recap what you did there? Like, what was the the technique behind what you did? Yeah, so there were a few things at play there. Obviously, no one saw the discovery, and I had the benefit of being able to make it all up, which is a large advantage. Um, but uh, there's there's a few things at play. Um, one is um, what I'm doing at the beginning there is what I call summarize and elevate. Um, so simply summarizing what a customer says to you is not enough. You can't just say, "Hey, I hear your SDRs are picking up the phone," and they're reaching gatekeepers or people are hanging up on them. You need to summarize and elevate the conversation. So rather than, hey, your SDRs aren't getting people on the phone. Hey, Jason, sounds like you're investing really heavily in five full-time SDRs right now who aren't yielding enough results and they're raising your cost per acquisition, right? So I'm trying to elevate the problem by summarizing it. Um, then I'm presenting a solution and then I'm checking down. And I'm trying to get your confirmation that this would drive you closer to your ideal future state, the one that hopefully we presented on that slide at the top of the call. Okay, there's another thing that you did I think is super important. We didn't talk about this with engagement is screen sharing. Mm. You oh, yeah. summarized and elevated the problem before you shared your screen. And then you showed the thing and you talked about it and then when you move on to the next thing, I'm assuming that you stop sharing your screen and then you summarize another problem, elevate it, and then go in. Was that intentional? And if so, why? So, you know, what's interesting is um, this isn't something I had thought about prior to the prep for this webinar very much. Um, I mean, there have been certain situations where I've thought about it. Um, I've been on the phone with reps where 
you know, for instance, they'll bring up a pricing sheet at the end of a call and that pricing sheet will stay on the screen all the way through until the end of the call. There's no thought about whether, so I thought about it in that context uh, in terms of, okay, all they're doing is looking at that dollar amount. <laughs> they're not, they're not listening to you anymore. Um, yeah. And you know, maybe having a panic attack, but, um, <laughs> but I love this idea and it's something that I've actually started to do more since we talked about it in the prep leading up to this of, oh, cool. of stopping the screen share and, and really sectioning out the demo. Yeah. I just, I find that it brings the focus back to the conversation. If people were looking over now, all of a sudden they're paying attention. And I mean, the science supports that you cannot read and listen at the same time. You can't do those at a, high level at the same time. I mean, when you share your screen, what it is signaling to the other person is that I am about to present to you. And your prospects have been trained by crummy sales reps. And they've been trained when they were at, in college that when someone is sharing a presentation or sharing a screen, that it's my turn to listen. And so you're actually tapping into that when you share your screen and you actually, when you take it down, it signals, oh, time for conversation. And so you're right. That's why you stop and start screen share as opposed to leaving it up the whole time. Evan, you're up. All right, let's do it, Jason. Well, look, you were telling me that you've got really ambitious hiring goals for the year, but what you've seen lately in your hiring cycles is a lot of candidates that are either showing up late or ghosting you, you've got hiring managers that might be doing the same, there's confusion around the board. And you're looking for a way to eliminate the gaps in your process to ensure that the interviews that you're scheduling actually occur and you can keep and get more candidates into the funnel faster. My curiosity, Jason, I have some ideas for you, but to put it on you, if that's okay for a second, what do you think is causing that issue? You know, I'm not really sure. I We have a lot of people that we're trying to get in. Um, you know, we run a, a franchise of, you know, restaurants and things, as you know. And, and one of the big things is that the disruption when people don't show up and I have people sitting there, you know, waiting to interview them, um, it really disrupts our business. Um, but I'm not sure, honestly, why people aren't showing up. Um, I know, like, we have our hiring managers. They're supposed to be you know, confirming the interviews and sending out, you know, emails. And I think we have them sending out texts. Um, I'm not sure that that happens necessarily all of the time, but yeah, I'm not really sure why people aren't showing up, to be honest with you. So, yeah, really, I think it sounds like there's a, a gap in visibility into what's actually happening and when it's happening. Yeah. So, yeah. I, so if, if that's really what is occurring, Here's an idea for you just to, to help you understand where we can really help drive some better behavior. And we're gonna talk about the concept of workflows within Calendly, which is automation that is designed to eliminate as many of the manual redundancies that exist around the interviews that you're scheduling. So if you think about it, you're actually scheduling great, but that it doesn't end there. Your recruiters, your coordinators, your hire managers, they have to be responsible for sending email confirmations, email reminders, those text reminders. What about the, the interviewer themselves? Two areas I would point us to would be one text reminder to the host, and then two text reminder to the invitee, meaning we are going to automatically send a text to both the candidate and the interviewer ahead of the interview based on whatever timing and frequency you need to ensure they actually show up. And in fact, I was working with another large organization having these same challenges. They implemented Calendly, they implemented these workflows and their show rates improved by 90% just on these text reminders alone. Jason, if we could improve that show rate by even 20%, what kind of impact do you think that would have on your hiring cycles? Well, I mean, that's, that allows us to staff the stores that we, that we need to in probably a week or two versus it taking months. So that's, that's really the big challenge right now is it takes so long to hire and place people. Cool. 
Good stuff, dude. Again, let's reverse engineer it. What's kind of the thinking and process behind what you just did? Yeah, so I think there there's a couple of things there. I mean, Brian makes a good point. Look, this is kind of pretend, so I just made it up on the spot. However, I think the the, the overall strategy is, look, we need to pinpoint exactly what's going to derive some value. And if I know, okay, you've mentioned a, a specific pain point. So let's kind of back into, well, how can my solution solve for that? That's what I want to show. But I also want to take it a step further, not just by summarized, summarizing the, the problem statement, but also I ask you a question because I want to reconfirm and maybe get some more information that might be helpful so that I can frame up how this little piece of the product is going to solve for that pain point and drive that, that type of value. And then on the end, I want to bring it all back to you to, to really articulate to me, here's what I've learned and here's why I think it could be valuable. Yeah. To bring the conversation full circle, we talked about how to tailor demos for below the line and above the line buyers. And that's how you do it. You take a feature that solves a, a pain point and you scaled it up to the, you know, how do you see this show rates impacting your ability to staff these, you know, stores or restaurants, you know, in the example, you scale it up to the business problem that it solves. Um, good stuff, Evan. Last but not least, Nick. Beautiful. So turn. I'm going to be selling to you. I'm going to be selling to outbound squad, Jason. So, um, oh. so Jason, what I'm going to do here is I'm going to take you through what a activation or a sponsorship with 30 minutes to president's club looks like. And what I'll do is I go through this. We've got a couple different tiers for how we could work together. I'll actually show you some examples of what other folks have done to make it a little bit more real for you. Um, so I'll take you through make a splash and then I'll take you through cannonball. Sound good? Cool. I don't know if you're sharing the right screen here. Oh no. I feel like a fool. We've all been there, man. Oh, we have I don't all know what there. I was sharing. I hope it was something good. Um, all right, so step one, demo takeaway. Make sure that you share the wrong screen. <laughs> the wrong screen. The best thing to do is share like your private Slack with your manager because that is the best way to get the buyer to go, ooh, let me see what Nick's saying with his team. No, don't actually do that. Oh, I feel like a fool. So, okay, whoop, start from the beginning. So Jason, what I'm gonna do here is I'm gonna take you through what a sponsorship with 30 Minutes to President's Club looks like. You've got a couple different tiers for activating with us. You've got a make a splash option and a cannonball option. And I'll take you through both of them in full. Um, and along the way, what I'll do is I'll show you some examples of what some other folks have done just to make this a little bit more real for you. Sound good? Cool. Beautiful. Um, so step one, let's talk about the podcast. One of the things that you told me, Jason, was that Lots and lots of folks know you for these amazing sales webinars that you throw, but not as many people know about the somewhat new um, outbound sprint cohort program that you launched. And you really want to make sure that the market becomes aware of that. So here's what we're going to do. Over the course of your sponsorship, we're going to run 800,000 30 second long ads where we are promoting your outbound sprint program. And then what we'll also do is let's bring you on to the 30 Minutes to President's Club podcast and have you talk about why that motion is really impactful for salespeople that are looking to upskill. It actually makes me think a little bit about one of our sponsors is a company called ZoomInfo. I presume you're familiar with them. And they're trying to do this thing where a lot of folks know ZoomInfo for their data product, but they want to make sure that the world knows about some of the other use cases that ZoomInfo has. And so what we actually did was we had um, Henry, who's ZoomInfo CEO, come on to our podcast and talk about some of that stuff. And so I think you could fit in really nicely there. Um, how does that feel to you? I know we're going to go through the rest, but I want to make sure you feel comfortable with the podcast piece. I could talk about that for like six hours, but you probably don't want me to do that. Yeah. So you feel like the podcast with our outbound sprint program that we're going to be promoting heavily in January, this will help with like the positioning and the branding and, and getting it in front of more people. I think so. I mean, let's talk about it. Like you've got a 30 second ad and we're going to run it 800,000 times. Like ideally, what would you like us to talk about in that ad? All right, let's, let's stop there. Um, it's, it's funny because I'm like, ah, maybe we should. <laughs> <laughs> oh, Nick, we have two and a half minutes quickly. 
let's reverse engineer what you just did. There's some specific things that looks like that were going on there. Give yep. us a little little blueprint of what you just did. Yeah. Um, so first I told you what we were going to do. I was going to take you through a sponsorship. I was going to show you examples along the way. Then what I did, I only showed one element, but um, I mentioned the problem that you had. I mentioned the two pieces of how we were going to solve that. I showed you an example that was somewhat similar. And then I thought, in my personal opinion, uh, the best thing that I did was I asked you what you wanted the ads to say. Because again, I want this to be a mutual exploration of how we're going to solve this together. And if you feel like you've taken ownership of that, how I might do that for Zoom Info is be like, you know, Brian, you showed the, the document shredding thing. You might say something like, well, you know, what other intense data or, or signals would you like to search for? Because I can show you in here how we would do that. I want them to feel like they own it. And Nick, one th subtle thing that I thought you did that was insanely powerful was to show the podcast in Spotify. Mm -hmm. Makes it very real. You showed it in the platform that Jason's most likely to listen to This American Life or whatever podcast you listen to and makes it very real, which I liked. Yeah. yeah. And he weaved in the customer story, right? Which was good. Um, dude, you guys, this blew by. We could definitely do a second like series on this, which we might have to do. And I think there's some really big takeaways from this around, hey, our goal is not to show everything to the buyer because they just don't need to see everything, right? So what do we need to show to create action and continue advancing the deal? We talked about some really good stuff that we can do for prep. Uh, I think the biggest takeaway with the actual demo is like be very selective about the features, um, sort of give the prospect context into what you're about to show and why it's so important. Share your screen and show them, stop sharing and then ask them if it resonates. Like if you just took that one simple thing away, your demos would massively improve. Um, I dropped into the chat where you can connect with everyone. Let's blow up uh, Brian, Evan, uh, and Nick's uh, LinkedIn profiles. So go ahead and click on it and connect with them. Go ahead and make sure to check out zoominfocalendly.com and throw in, where are we at here? 30mpc.com as well. And Jason Bay's outbound sprint program, because it's one of the best <laughs> ways to upskill as a salesperson. If you liked what we did today and you want to go way deeper, yeah. um, seriously, man, I've learned so much about selling from you over the years and you don't ever plug yourself enough. Seriously, go check it out. Go to Jason's site. It is a great way to improve as a sales professional. Appreciate it. Uh, Brian, Evan, Nick, thank you for your time today, you guys and everyone else. Have a good one. We'll see ya. See you Good all. Stuff. Thanks for all the engagement. Thank you, everyone.